Thanks for everyone for attending our, our analyst panel. Uh, analysts, of course, are, are the thought leaders for our investors in regenerative medicine. Um, they also, as many of us know, offer uh, free counseling in the form of extremely strong opinions to us CEOs, uh, which is very much uh, appreciated. Um, and we've got a great panel here, and we're going to talk and hear their perspective uh, on the industry, on the changes in the industry, on the current state of the industry, uh, to complement what we've had earlier today. So with us today, uh, from your uh, right to left towards me, uh, Jason Napadano from Sachs, Zach's Small Cap Research, uh, Steve Brozak from WBB Securities, and uh, Jason Colbert from uh, Maxim Group. Uh, each of them is going to take a little time uh, to discuss their current uh, current uh, opinions and, and overview on the state of Regen Med. Uh, I'll let them go through it a little bit. And why don't we start, um, Jason Napadano, if you go on, go ahead and start. Jason, in. Okay. Is this, this on? Okay. Um, so I, uh, I take kind of a bottoms-up approach in my analysis to the, to the sector. I, um, I try to avoid <laughs> making kind of big picture and sweeping investment uh, recommendations. Uh, I, I'm not the kind of guy that believes that a rising boat lifts all tides. I, I think that uh, within the sector, I see investment opportunities, uh, and I, I see names that are worth buying right now, and I see names that you should avoid right now. Um, the, the main thing that I look for uh, when recommending stock to, to the readers of Zacks is three things. Uh, it's got to have cash. It's got to have catalysts. And then it's got to have charisma. So what does all that mean? Well, catalysts means if the stock doesn't have a major catalyst coming in the next, I'd say, six months or, or 12 months, but more, more likely six months, uh, then you're not going to generate the kind of investor interest into the story. It's got to have cash to get to that catalyst. Because as, as a sell-side analyst, it's extremely difficult to convince investors, whether they're institutional investors or retail investors, which, which tend to be the majority of the Zacks readers, to invest in anything uh, ahead of a big financing. Um, I mean, that's kind of the number one question that I get is, well, what do they do and do they have the cash to get there? And then the third thing is, is the charisma. You know, what, what is their pipeline? What is their platform? What is their technology? Uh, and when you listen to their technology, you listen to their platform and you hear what they do, does it kind of pique your interest? Is it something that no one else is doing? Uh, is it something that really has the potential to be a kind of a game changer? Uh, and I'll just you know, give you some examples of some names that I'm recommending right now. Um, one of them, in, uh, specifically an opportunity in ALS. And we know ALS, there's very little out there for ALS. Um, there's Sanofi is really a tech, but it doesn't really do all that much and it doesn't really sell all that much. Uh, and we all witnessed Biogen's failure with Dexapram last week. So within ALS, uh, I like the opportunity in, in neural stem. And you know, we can argue whether or not this will be a big drug in five or six years from now, but that's not my investment call. Uh, my investment call in neural stem is that it's got those three things that I look for. It's got catalysts. They're going to have, they're in a phase one trial now. Uh, we've seen most of the data from the trial already. They've actually published it. I believe they published it in stem cell. Um, but we're going to get a final analysis from that phase one trial in March. So beautiful. That's a catalyst that's coming two months from now. They raise money in November. So they got cash plenty of cash to get to that catalyst in March. So I like that. And then Charisma. Uh, they're, they've got a technology where they're injecting neuronal stem cells into the spinal cord in patients with ALS. And it's a 15-patient trial, and so you've got to be careful about reading too much into a 15-patient trial. And there were patients that showed absolutely no benefit whatsoever. Um, but there were patients that showed some pretty significant benefit. So I consider that Charisma. And is that a pretty big drug if it works? Absolutely. Do I know that they're ever going to make it to market? No, I don't have a clue. Uh, but that's not my investment call. My investment call is right now, you've got the three things that I look for in a good investment. The second, I think, opportunity is um, in spinal cord injury. And the name that I'll point to there is in vivo therapeutics. Um, charisma, certainly charisma. Um, they're, they're, 
they were going to start a, an IDE trial. And, and the interesting thing about it is that it's a humanitarian device exemption trial in five patients with uh, complete tetraplegia, Asia A, spinal cord injury. And they're probably going to start that trial in about a month. And it'll be a very fast trial, five patients, open label design with data kind of rolling out patient by patient. So that's a clear catalyst. I mean, we'll know from today, if they start the trial in a month, we'll know in two or three months whether or not it works. Go back and look at their primate data. Um, go back and look at some of the videos that they've got on their website of, of uh, the, the African green monkeys, paralyzed African green monkeys that they've got up and running. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of science fiction type stuff, but that's charisma and that's catalysts. And they have cash. They have cash to get all the way into 2014. I mean, certainly they're going to need cash again at some point in the future, but there's, I see very little risk of a need for cash ahead of that data. And if it works, it's humanitarian device exemption, it could be on the market next year. That's a biotech investment. Um, I say the final opportunity is in stroke. We know stroke has been a minefield of drug development over the past couple of years. And um, I cover cytomedics. And in doing research on cytomedics, I probably came across two dozen or more uh, stroke drugs, mostly small molecules that have failed over the past decade. The interesting thing that they kind of all had in common is they're all one molecule, one mechanism, one pathway, and they're all going after that two to three to the five hour window post stroke. And they all went down the same path and they all did the same thing wrong and they all failed. Cell therapy, and the panel before talked about this, multiple mechanisms of action, multiple potential pathways. So interesting in a sense of how you're gonna treat something that really no one has figured out how to treat. Um, so charisma, uh, catalysts, well, Cytomedics has a trial that's ongoing right now. It's phase two in stroke. It should offer data later this year. It's a little bit longer than I usually like to tell people, um, but I think the stock will perform well into that data. The one thing that they don't have is cash, um, so not the, not the perfect investment at this time, but I think they're going to raise cash. I mean, I've got no insight into that. We don't do banking, um, but you know, I can read a balance sheet and I can, you know, I can forecast cash, cash flows and I, I can tell they're going to raise cash soon. So my investment call or what I've been writing in my research reports to the readers of Zacks is wait for that financing. When it's complete, now you've got an investment opportunity. And I'll just wrap up with what I don't like and uh, what I wouldn't recommend buying is someone who doesn't have catalyst and someone who doesn't have cash. And they, those may be the names that have the best technology. Um, you know, there's a lot of very large cardiovascular programs going, cardiomyopathy, MI, critical limb ischemia. Um, those may turn out to be enormous drugs, but in my opinion, they're too big, too expensive, and there's not enough partners. And so those are the kind of investments I would be. If you don't have catalysts, and you don't have cash, your stock price goes, well, for you guys, it just kind of bleeds. <laughs> so, you know, right. I would avoid that kind of stuff. Well, Jason, let me jump in and ask some questions of you rather than wait till the end of all of you to talk to, while it's topical here. Um, let me ask a couple questions. Um, catalysts, the time frame that you're looking to see catalysts within for a company, what is that? How far out do you look? And then would you be recommending companies that you saw maybe as seeing troubled waters beyond the first catalyst, but you could see that they could get successfully to that catalyst for the investors you're speaking to at a given time? Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's amazing when I talk to investors. I mean, if you tell someone, well, they're going to have data in the fourth quarter, they kind of look at you like, the fourth quarter? <laughs> it's January. Um, so, yeah, uh, people, I'd like to see catalysts in three to six months. Um, and I think the market tends to bid stocks up into clinical data or into FDA decisions around that three to four month window. And, you know, if, if you're not confident in the decision, you're not confident in the data, I mean, you know, you can, you can sell stock. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think anything longer than six months, then you're starting to get kind of sleepy time. Um, 12 months, I think, is too long. And it all comes kind of back to cash. I mean, ha catalysts far out are OK if they have the cash to get to those catalysts and pass those catalysts. But if you've got six months of cash and you've got a trial that's going to read out in 12 months, 
you're, yep. you know, yep. that's Absolutely. not investment. I get it. Jason, please yeah, jump yeah, in. So I, I have to tell you, I completely disagree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, uh, That's, a, now we have a panel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. I, I have a uh, cell rating on neural stem. Uh, I, I think that you know, neural stem has real fundamental problems in the industry. <laughs> I'm uh, very concerned among stroke. I, I don't think it's cytomedics. I think it's atherosis. And, and you know, my experience in following the industry is, you know, and it's so acutely aware to me, when I returned from Japan after launching Intron A for Hep C, I came back and I had a vision of a paradigm shift in Hep C. And I remember when Pharmacet's hepatitis B drug failed, and the stock had about an $80 million market cap. And you're right, it was like pulling teeth to get people to look at Pharmacet. But it became very clear, based on the science, that this pan-genotypic nucleoside that Pharmacet was talking about had the potential to be really big. It was paradigm shifting in hep C. So you had to look beyond three months. You had to look beyond kind of the hedge fund push for a short-term catalyst, and you invested. And I think what we're really talking about here when we talk about regenerative medicine is a paradigm shift. And I think medicine as we know it can change, and it can change very dramatically. I believe that smart investors, and the reason why you follow biotechnology is because you follow the clinical data. And there are mountains of clinical data that suggest that cell therapy works. And certainly in cardiovascular disease, it's going to be huge. Um, you talked a little bit about, you, you mentioned the cardiovascular space and a lack of partners. Um, it was very interesting to me to watch Jeremy Levin of Teva make a commitment to move forward with a 1,700-person CHF trial for mesoblast. We know that Athersis is partnered with Pfizer and ulcerative colitis. We haven't been hearing a lot from Celgene. Um, Baxter is currently running a phase three trial in CMI, although there are issues there, and I want to talk about those. But I think part of the problem on Wall Street is there tends to be a very short-term focus. And, and what we have to do as analysts, in, in my opinion, is get behind the companies we really like, look at the science, look at the technologies, and act as a champion and raise stakeholder awareness to move beyond just the short-term catalysts. Okay, I'll uh, jump in and disagree with both my esteemed colleagues. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first off, know your audience. How many people here really believe in efficient markets? Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> Three, four very brave souls. Okay. How many people believe in reaction to stimulus? Whether it's in a lab or whether it's investors being prodded because they just lost 75% of their portfolio. Okay. Now we have a more realistic understanding of how the world really works, right? Okay. I'll give you an example here. And this is a little bit stale. It's the weekend. The same piece of news. Tepid job growth fuels worry. Wall Street Journal headline, right? What does the New York Times say? Job creation is still steady despite worry. <laughs> what do you have? You've got the same story, but for all intents and purposes, you've got a different approach to it. Which we have to think about for a second is, these are the thought leaders. These are the stories that people read, right? We as analysts go out there and we feed the beast. Now, you take another really important story here. This is a couple of weeks ago. This is the story basically about what? Jerry Seinfeld on the front cover talks about how he's an exact comic. He's a scientist. He's a perfectionist. Well, what's inside? We talk about the Nobel Prize winning efforts. And why the Nobel Prize winning efforts went to a dead man. So for all intents and purposes, nobody talked about the fact that here was the paradigm shift in dendritic stem cell research where a man goes out there and puts his life on the line trying to prove something at the end, and they talk about it based on the fact that he's dead, okay? I don't want to hear about efficient markets. I don't want to hear about short-term returns. I don't want to hear about going out there and saying you can pick something because, candidly, I remember when Amgen was a dollar stock. <laughs> I remember when I was one of only two analysts covering Celgene Corporation, and they decided to go out there and start marketing thalidomide, and then I was just one of only one analyst, okay? And I remember the, the stories about, okay, you're peddling poison, and it's going to go on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And then I remember the stock going from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 200. And obviously, 
I remember all the CEOs when they were just poor millionaires. And now you've got a company that basically has one of the largest stem cell programs on the face of the planet, and obviously very few people understand it. So what we've got here is a situation. What do people look for? What do investors look for? They look for certainty. They look for guarantees. We have an advantage in what we do. I don't just cover biotech. I cover pharma. I cover med devices. So as a result, I've got positive performance. And what am I seeing? Positive performance? Well, I'm seeing fund managers that can't beat the indexes. That's what they care about because their jobs depend on whether or not they beat the indexes. Now, here's an irony. Vaccines versus, uh, who was it? Gil mentioned Greek, Greek, uh, Greek austerity. A year ago, I'm at a panel discussion preparing my notes, and a guy sits down and says, what do you do? He sells biologics in Greece. I stop what I'm doing and I say, I really want to talk to you because how the hell do you make a living? And on the other side, we have vaccine maker. The vaccine makers guaranteed a profit. The government has to buy all their stuff. The profits are not sexy. The stock goes nowhere. Stelios sends me a holiday card. Guy gets paid in Greek debt and guess what? Here is his return and this guy made literally 100% return on his money. Counterintuitive, isn't it? But the realities are it's the perception that counts. And the perception I've seen does lift all boats. You've got a situation where, sorry, I, my, you know, doing this for a long time, you have to remember things. The markets do respond to stimulus. They aren't efficient. And I've mentioned the Amgen cell gene story. On the stem cell front line, you know, um, our performance has been remarkably good, although uh, my wife won't acknowledge it. But uh, fund managers asking us, what do we think? And I'm saying to them, I don't know who the winners are going to be. I do know that we had panelists up here. We had Athersis, we had Satori, two companies we follow and we like. We also have gone out there and written sell and sell short reports. And people take it personally. When you get an email saying that lethal injection is too good for you, you gotta wonder about who's reading what you're, uh, what you're writing, you know? But, but the reality is that uh, Manya was in here a little bit earlier talking about, well, what about, you know, the embryonic development? Because I remember working on the initial public offering for Geron almost 20 years ago, and everyone was looking at it going, my God, this is the holy grail. Well, 20 years later, we have a situation where a lot of people now are saying, what is it? The irony is this, to quote a remarkable author, you know, this is the best of times and this is the worst of times. Why is it the best of times? Because a lot of people have figured out every way for something not to work. And now we're suddenly starting to figure out how things can work. So, Steve, let me uh, jump in and actually pick out a theme that you just went to, talking about Greece and some of the overarching things. I'll open it up to the other panelists for a question I want to ask, and then we'll make sure to get Jason Kay his time as well. Um, I think, how do you think people react in our space, particularly to everything you see going on globally? We've got Greek debt still overhanging. Uh, we've got, you know, the United States uh, government demonstrating time and again that it's inefficiencies. If you don't believe in efficient markets, you can certainly be sure we have an inefficient government right now. How is that affecting um, our space in particular? Obviously, we know it's affecting Wall Street in general. Uh, we've done quite well this year. Uh, maybe is that a contrarian uh, indicator that people feel that we're more solid and stable in healthcare? How's this? I'll, I'll, I'll contradict the moderator. <laughs> the government is actually stepping up to the plate. For the first time, we're seeing the government actually going out there. They're not writing checks other than NAID and NIH. They're writing government contracts. And if you read these contracts, if you read what's going on, they're actually saying, if you go out there and do this, we will buy. And they're using a very interesting way of doing it. They're saying dual use. If it works for this, It'll work for something else. And the realities are we're seeing behavior that we've never seen before. They are now understanding that they are the backstop. Why? And I'll end it with this. About three months ago, there was a big panel discussion held down in Bethesda. The title of the meeting was Saving Large Pharma. And the pharmaceutical companies actually showed up for a meeting like that. Can you figure? Now, what happened? The government flat out said we're not paying these bills. The pill a day model is gone. And we want to see restorative processes take place. And the first person through the door is basically going to be rewarded. And we will go out there and incentivize. And where I have to say this is, investors are simple creatures. They want 
sons of. They want sequels. They want, can you give me another company just like this except for the one that hasn't gone up 700%? So my answer to you there is, when you see that breakthrough that is probably going to be co-sponsored by the government, that's when you're going to start to see the investors flock in, and now they have to flock in because they don't have the performance. Well, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, Jason, why don't you uh, jump in here and go, th yeah, go through some well, of your first, thoughts? Well, first, a couple of things. As an analyst, I follow this industry, and there's a report out back. It's interesting because the title of the report is A Year of Inflection Ahead, so I really was pleased to see Gil mention that you know he also thinks there's a year of inflection. To me, it's no longer F, and that's been the problem in the industry. For the last 10 years, people have been saying, is it real? Uh, that, that's really no longer the question. And then people started saying, well, when? And I, I actually believe that that's the wrong question, too, because it's very, very evident that there are multiple late-stage clinical trials. And we know that companies, as they approach approval, start to see an increase in valuation. I think what's much more important for us as an industry is to focus on SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I think that we as analysts who are kind of pioneering this industry have been too caught up in the is it real and addressing that and feeling like we have to defend it. And then caught up on when, when is the next catalyst, when will the trial work, is the trial properly designed. This industry has been starving for capital, and the lack of capital has resulted in slower than expected clinical data. But that's changing. We're seeing balance sheets getting stronger among many of the players in the industry. I think going forward, what we've got to do is apply the traditional metrics. What are the cost of goods being sold? Dendrion is a pioneer. Provenge is the first immunotherapy to really be commercialized successfully in the marketplace. But you have to underline successfully. I don't know that the arduous therapy that's involved, I don't know that the minimum benefit and the high cost truly is going to be the breakthrough. I think that it is a pioneer as a first generation therapy, but there absolutely will be a second generation therapy and a third generation therapy. And it's interesting. I disagreed very strongly with Mark Frolak when he used Stimuvax as a metric for why uh, Provenge's dendritic ex vivo approach is the only way that uh, in the path towards the future in oncology. In fact, there are many really interesting companies that will pioneer immu immu immunological approaches to oncology using ex vivo approaches. But in cardiology, right in front of us, we're on the verge of a breakthrough. In ischemic diseases and in stroke, certainly maybe the most important trial of our time is being undertaken by atherces. So I think that as this data starts to come, people will start to look at, well, what is this therapy? How is it prepared? How will it be used? What's its cost of goods? Is it readily available? I think that there's a huge battle coming in the marketplace between allogeneic and autologous therapies. And for the most part, analysts haven't been paying attention. I think that in this space, because it's so new and it's so novel, that it's critical that you look at it from a large macro point of view and say, therapeutically, how does this work, and apply the traditional metrics, and then do the specific bottoms-up analysis. But I will tell you, when we look at the burden and the cost of chronic disease, regenerative medicine is clearly one of the only areas that holds true hope for bringing in the out-of-control costs in a rising healthcare system, and that's why we're beginning to see more and more government involvement and sponsorship of these trials. So I'm actually very, very excited. You know, Wall Street's a funny place. If we go back to the pharmacet example, when the stock was three and four dollars, you could not get anybody to look at the company. And then when the stock was fifty dollars, it was just the rage, and it's what everybody wanted to talk about until Gilead acquired them for $125 a share. So smart investors have to look at the intrinsic valuations, have to evaluate the science of these companies, and have to decide, is the approach that NeuralSTEM is really doing with five or six million dollars on the balance sheet, taking on an ALS trial, taking on a stroke trial, and taking on a small molecule trial for depression, really, is that really gonna be the future, or is it gonna be me Blast, $200 million, partnered with Teva, 1,700-person CHF trial, which Teva will pay for, not Mesoblast. 
Mesoblast is going to report data from three trials in the next week or two, talking about spinal fusion and talking about degenerative disc disease. What if? What if the atherosis trial hits its endpoint in Crohn's disease? What if the atherosis trial shows dramatic results in stroke? What if Cytorian, an autologous player, can catch Baxter to the marketplace in chronic myocardial ischemia by using an innovative pathway, the PMA pathway instead of the BLA pathway? It's never been a more exciting time in the industry to understand the spectrum of companies, the diseases they're tackling, and how they're going to change the paradigm. Since he wants oh, to make okay. a comment, to I, counter your optimism, he wants to bring it down. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> in complete disclosure, we were both in the Marine Corps, but he was up in the air and I was on the ground. So I, I actually had to come up close and personal and kill people. And he just dropped bombs from 10,000 feet. So the reality is this. Serendipity plays more than anything else. And it's not just luck. It's going out there and finding the counterintuitive result. The pharmaceutical example is a great example. We're going to write a cell report on the company. And I said to myself, yeah, but guess what? If we're wrong, and I don't mean if we're wrong about the technology, if we're wrong in terms of someone coming out and taking them out, we're totally screwed. Okay? That's the reality. The realities are we do not live in a perfect world. I used to like to think that there were long-term investors. I now know that there are renters and short sellers whenever you're going out there and doing a deal, okay? The realities are that we need to start to see fundamental investors coming back in. And smart investors, they don't have portfolio managers. Do you think the big funds basically have people that are dedicated to this space? They rotate them like we change shoes. The ideas are they do bring in gunslingers, and actually the most interesting investors are the ones that hire people that are experts and they'll ask the best questions. But if you look for them to be you know, there on the next 13 filing, they're not there. So the reality is this. You want to go on and change the paradigm? Absolutely. You want to go out there and get a breakthrough result? Absolutely. But what happened? How did Celgene get its breakthrough? They had results, OK? We've seen some biotech, some stem cell companies outline results, but unfortunately, they didn't go out there and they didn't follow it through with KOLs. There was a guy named Bart Barlogi that was very, very well known in multiple myeloma. You cannot go out there and make a statement without having the key opinion leaders say, guess what, this is different. And you know you have them when they say, I would do this for my family. That's when all of a sudden things start to change. And when all of a sudden they say, I don't care if this isn't approved in the United States, we're going to fly to Europe and do this, or we're going to go down to, to, to uh, South or Central America, or we're going to go anywhere where this is available, whether it's Canada, whether it's Japan. That's when you start to see a change. And that's all of a sudden when you start to see these single cell myopic fund managers start to realize, guess what? We have to be in this now. And at that point then, there is a problem. You're going to have so much cash coming in here, you're going to have to now make decisions as to what do you really fund? The pharmaceutical companies, you know, I asked a question before about what happens when you have competing products. Every pharmaceutical company should have competing products because the reality is there is no guarantee that one path will work. They may do different things. The things that they do will probably not be what you intentionally started out to look at. But when you do find something that works, when that counterintuitive result comes up, that's when it behooves analysts to go out there and reach out to the portfolio managers and reach out to the media and say, no, you don't get it. This is truly different. And then you start to see the investors come in and they start to write checks. And then running a bank, then all of a sudden I start to get words from my desk saying, we're seeing a flow of orders here that we can't account for. It's coming in everywhere else. What do you want to do? And then it's all of a sudden a situation where you start to say, okay, Let's start going out there, becoming active again. Yeah, so lots of optimism here. We'll get that. We'll get to that point. I think. Um, let's talk a little bit about a point that Jason K touched on, which was uh, autologous uh, therapies versus allogeneic. Um, you know, we've seen that Dendrion has had trouble hitting some of its projections. Uh, what do people think on the panel? What do our panelists think about how that's affected the outlook for autologous therapies? Is it a very steep uphill climb for companies pushing those now? I, I think it's a great question, and I think that Dendrion, in a lot of ways, did a disservice to a lot of companies because there is an intense scrutiny now, or at least I believe there should be an intense scrutiny, 
on what is the cost of goods sold. And clearly, when we look at regenerative medicine and away from oncology, um, it's going to be very important to have a compelling value proposition. Now, not all, not all autologous therapies are the same. And not everybody is absolutely aware, but Baxter has been shopping their cell therapy division. Why? I mean, the principal investigator in that phase three trial, to me, is one of the top cardiologists, is one of the um, key opinion leaders in regenerative medicine, Dr. Douglas Ordo. I absolutely believe, by the way, that the CD34 cell that both Baxter and Neostem are working with will be successful and will have successful results. The problem is that I also believe that there are going to be other approaches. Cytori has a really interesting autologous approach. What's fascinating is the cost of goods of that product are allogeneic-like. So while I'm not smart enough to tell you that engraftment or that there are uh, real advantages over autologous versus allogeneic, we really won't know that for many, many years. I can tell you that if the autologous therapy for Baxter, um, which is probably estimated to cost around we'll call it $15,000 a unit, takes several days of processing time, requires the patient to return to the hospital several times, compared to essentially an off-the-shelf ready product or a product that's made while you wait, which is really the Cytori product, how is it gonna compete against that? You know, as an analyst, and again, to use another hep C paradigm, Vertex launched Tilaprovir. It's really one of the first, most successful antivirals, but it's three times a day. And a three times a day pill is just not going to be viable. It's why Gilead is using a once a day pill, an HIV, that has four different mechanisms of action. And they're absolutely following that model uh, when they looked at the acquisition of Farmset to treat H uh, HCV. So patient compliance is critical. The therapy has to be easy to use in the acute setting. It's got to be rapidly available. And the cheaper the cost of goods, the more flexible you can be in really creating economic value. And I think that's going to be critical. And for me, I think that explains why Baxter is looking to exit the cell therapy space. Even though they have a cell therapy that I believe works, the fact is it doesn't meet the SWOT analysis requirements when you stack it up against the competitive threats of the allogeneic and some of the autologous players like a Cytori. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I think if if you can have an off-the-shelf product or a, or a site-of-care product that's going to generate the kind of data that an autologous and safety that an autologous product is going to have, then that off-the-shelf product is, or, or the point-of-care product is going, to, is going to win. We have one point of agreement on the panel today, oh, folks. Okay. That's good. That's good. I, I, I'm actually going to go in Oh, there. boy. I, 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 can't, I, can't, <laughs> I have to keep consistency with my model here. Here's the thing that we haven't talked about, the regulators. Why did they go out there and say to Dendrion, we're going to go out there and do this? The idea was that they knew that this was safe, because that's all they care about. No one in government ever lost their job for basically approving a product that didn't work as long as it was safe. But they did lose their job if there were untoward events. Now what you have is a situation where you've got products that candidly lend themselves very carefully to safety. And the idea behind that is, what is the next generation product going to be? What happens if Dendrion had a model? The model was the first of its kind. And in business school, they taught us one thing. The fast follower is usually the one that goes out there and gets it actually right. So that's how I'll say it works. So we have uh, some mics out here, and I'd like to give some time for the audience to ask some questions. So please put your hand up, and we'll get you the mic. Uh, and, and ask away. Greg. Steve, uh, appreciate your comments on the high-level view of the field. Do you have any particular stocks you like and why? Okay. Uh, I'll do it in alphabetical order. That way no one feels slighted. Astrum. Why do I like them? Because, candidly, there's no other hope for all intents and purposes. You're going out there. They have a good funding source behind them. Uh, so you would look at them and you would say, okay, the story makes sense. How do we go out there? A little bit longer in time, but frankly, I'm happy to, happy to wait. Athersis, um, I like them because you have a off-the-shelf approach. For all intents and purposes, it's easily reproducible. Safety is not a question mark at all. Now you've got a situation where you can go out and say, Here's, here is a way to address concerns and do it in a more familiar manner to large pharma. 
Um, Celgene, I can't really comment about because, frankly, they're not here, and I know them all too well, and they bought me too many drinks in the past, so I'll skip that one. Satori, remarkable company. If you look at it, the government contract that they just got is a story that in itself is very unusual. Most government contracts say, if you do this in, if you repeat what you've done in NHPs, in humans, you'll get money. This is a contract that says, if you repeat what you have done in humans, in NHPs or in other animals, you will now get money. How many times in the world have you ever seen something like that? How many times have you seen a situation where the partnering arrangements, the number of patients that have been treated, the, the, the largesse that you already have, the data is there. And to quote, and this I will agree with my esteemed colleagues, the data is starting to roll out. So now you have a situation where you have inflection points. Those inflection points can be picked up by KOLs. The last company I happen to like is Neostem. One of the things about Dendrion is guess where they used to do their manufacturing at a sub? What would have happened? What would the story be today if they had stayed at that manufacturing? I'm not second guessing them, but I'm just saying that I can't tell you what's going to happen in terms of CD34, who ultimately wins. I know it's a remarkably strong element in everything that goes through, and our scientific staff has looked it over several times. And it's one component, but it's a strong component. Any, thanks, thanks, Steve. I'm not going to go into the ones we don't like, because <laughs> we'd be here all day. So you went alphabetically. I wonder if Astrum has had a financing advantage over the years for people going alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other questions from the audience? All right, well, since we're over time and we don't have any other questions, I want to thank our panelists, everyone. Uh, please give them a round of applause, and we'll wrap up. <laughs>